Good morning, everybody. My name is George Zelanti. I'm from Adelaide. I was allocated a role uh, to speak about the roles and accountability in the building process. Um, it seemed to me that when we do those things, there are really three parts to this question, and I'll try to break that down. Firstly, I want to do, um, identify who the roles were and what and the players in, in the actual group. Look at the accountability, that is, who are the people accountable to and what are they accountable for? And I'd like to finish with giving you an idea of a possible solution, how we actually get the industry working better. So let's take them one at a time. The first one, looking at players. I'm only concentrating on the main players here. It's impossible, it would be silly to list all of them. But these are the ones who actually have the biggest impact across the board. So let's talk about those. Firstly, the owners. Well, obviously the owners play a major role, but they tend to surround themselves with advisors, project managers and financiers initially, at least to get going. They sometimes have many other advisors as well. Very few of them are actually uh, building um, people themselves. So they need advice in order to get going. The second group is designers, architects and engineers. They play both, play both a direct and indirect role via design standards, architectural statements and so on. Um, and they play, they often advise, uh, they do the actual design work themselves, but sometimes they also can operate for, depending on the scale of the project, they can operate independently for other consultants within the group to provide advice. So who, who approves? What were the statutory functions? Well, there's local government, obviously. There's state government. There's planners. Building surveyors. And um, there's obviously in that there's local government, but also term and industry advisors. In, in some states, um, private building surveyors, uh, building surveyors give advice to uh, intending developers or intending builders about how best to prepare the design work in order to get it through um, the approval system quickly. Then there's the private certifiers themselves, the or private building surveyors in some states, who actually play a statutory function and approve the work. There's a the whole myriad of specialist consultants like fire engineers, access consultants, energy consultants, and so on. But that begs the question about the approvals. Well, initially, if you don't get financial approval for a major project, you are unlikely to, to go off. So financial is certainly one. Then there's the traditional planning approval, building approvals. And then there can be specialist approvals depending on the scale of the project. And through the course of the construction, there have to be approvals for progress claims throughout in order for the project to actually proceed. Of course, during the, uh, the project itself, there's a series of inspections, there's mandatory inspections, there's voluntary inspections. And the question I often ask is, what are we doing the inspections for? Is it for the community interest or is it to minimise risk? It's interesting if you speak to the insurance industry, they always use the term minimise risk. And I have no issue with that. But I don't think that those two um, documents, though, those two issues, community interest or minimise risk actually conflict. It's just the way that they are interpreted. But the one that I prefer, the one that I think sets the tone for everything is this issue of community risk, if you have community interest. If you do everything in the interest of the community, you will always minimise your risk and you will actually do the job as appropriate. The next group tends to be the builders. Well, they're generally responsible to the client. Budget tends to be a major constraint uh, in their work and sometimes self-certify on completion. Now, that's not necessarily the case across Australia, but in some states like mine, the end of a major project, the builder has to sign a bit of paper saying that he or she has built the or constructed the, the building or the structure in accordance with the approved documentation. It's a form of self-certification and it's a part of the quality assurance system to try to uh, ensure that the builder has done the right thing. Then there's material supplies themselves, tend to rely on external data about compliance of materials. And that indirectly involves the federal government by standards assessment, and even things like border control, where uh, people have to assess what is coming across the border. Specialist installers, we may certify the installation by the builder. Now, what that actually means is if there's a specialist installation that needs to go into a building, and you have to have a specialist group to actually install it, they act as subcontractors, if you like, to the builder, and that when the builder submits his or her uh, final completion certificate, he has to rely on these people to say that they've done the job properly. The next group 
the project managers. Now, let me say, when, when I talk about project managers, I do not mean the traditional construction project manager on a building site. I'm talking about the those who are responsible to the client. And those people have turned the industry, in my view, upside down in the last 20 years. And that's primarily because they're responsible to the client. So their primary interest is often, not always, but often financial. They often come from a management or financial background themselves. Uh, very rarely, sometimes they can't have an engineering or architecture or construction background, but that is rare. And that means that their understanding of the building process may not be uh, as good as perhaps it should be. And because they actually are paid by the client themselves, the builder or whoever it is, the client, then there may well be a conflict of interest situation. And the decisions they make may be tarnished by that perspective. The next group is the insurance companies. Obviously, they want to minimise their risk and they can control the industry by either refusing to provide PI cover or making it prohibitive in terms of cost. And I can give you a great example I was involved with myself only last year. A good friend of mine who is a practising civil engineer, that's his primary income. He has a very small private certification business on the side that he uses just to improve his actual engineering practice. And his income over several years has averaged about $12,000 a year. It's not from the private certification. That's not a large amount of money, but it's enough to keep him going and to actually, um, as he says, it informs my engineering practice. Now, over the years, he's paid around about $3,000 for PI cover on an annual basis. Last year, well, his quote was $15,000. That is more than what he was, his income was. So he thought, okay, if that's the case, I will cease uh, practice as a private certifier. So he asked for a runoff a cover, um, a runoff quote. And in, in our state, South Australia, we're obliged to get runoff insurance for a period of time to ensure that uh, the work done in the recent years is actually still covered for a certain amount of time. And the quote for that came back as $15,000. In other words, there was no difference. So clearly the insurance company was telling him we really don't want you anymore. We want you want to get rid of you from our books. The sad thing about that was that this guy never had a claim lodged against him, never had a client say, I don't like your work. Yet he was the one they were trying to get rid of. Now, luckily, we were able to find one other provider in this state, only one, who we had to go outside of our industry to do that, who was able to provide him with insurance at an acceptable term. But that's just one example of how insurance companies can control what's going on. The next one is the court system. Now, what I've written there about decisions being based on the law seems very, very sensible and very logical. But for very large, complex cases, like many of our big cases are, the judges or those who sit in judgment need to be educated about the whole process. Now, I can give you one example. In our state, many, many years ago, when in the early 90s, there was a spate of footing failures across the state. One person took uh, a local government to council and in those days it was all done by local councils and the court ruled that uh, the individual had the right to have a crack free dwelling very simple ruling but the implications of that were that as soon as there was a crack in a new dwelling people ran off to the court system and so and initially the insurance companies just paid up the councils also had deep pockets so they were involved in, in paying as well and that continued for several years until one council and one insurance company decided to make a stand. And that lasted 49 days in the Supreme Court here in Adelaide, where they had to slowly educate the actual judge as to what it all meant. As a result of that, the finding was quite different that just because you have a my crack in your house doesn't mean the building is actually failed. And everything then just changed overnight. But the process, what the point I'm trying to get across there is that courts make a decision based on the law. But for complex projects, you have to actually teach them what uh, the process is in order for them to make the appropriate actual uh, final judgment. Now, what about accountability? The question there is who to? Well, are we accountable to the client? I think we are. Are we accountable to the owner? Yes. To the builder, most definitely. Consultants, perhaps. But the overriding one that everybody seems to miss is the community at large or community interest, as I prefer to call it. I think we getting rid of those terms or not actually using them very much at all nowadays, yet that is a very important aspect. That if you keep community interest 
at the forefront of all the work that you do, you very rarely will go wrong. So what are we accountable for? Is it quality? Well, I think so. The specification actually says yes. When I say we, I'm talking about the industry in, in the broad sense. If you read any specification, it has issues about quality and workmanship. Compliance, most definitely, yes. Budget, well, you, it's in the contract, so there is somebody in the system that's definitely responsible for that. Life safety, all people are responsible for that. But the amazing thing is that all of those can actually have conflicts between them or amongst them. I've heard many building surveyors say to me, I'm not interested at all in the quality of the workmanship, I just want to make sure it stands up. And I think that's true, but that's also a short view about how the actual industry operates. And by fostering that approach, you don't do yourself a service. So how do we achieve a solution? I think once again, if you keep this issue in mind, you must act in community interest. I think you will actually go some way to understanding what my view is here. And these, I must stress, purely my views. Firstly, education. I think it's important that we increase the number of building surveying degrees across Australia. There's an importance to review all building surveying degrees to actually ensure their relevance. And I don't know Victoria very well, but for a state the size of Victoria, do they have enough recognised building surveying degrees? I think the answer from my perspective is no. By recognised, I'm not talking just about the state government. I'm also talking about the professional body. You must articulate, uh, increase the articulation process between TAFE and universities. That seems to be dying away of late, but I found when I was, I was at UniSA for 21 years and uh, building surveying was one of the programs I was in charge of. And some of my best students were those who articulated from TAFE. I think it's also incumbent on us to introduce more postgraduate degree pathways because that allows cognitive professionals into our profession. And I've heard in the past that some people were afraid of that because they don't want engineers coming into building surveying or other professions because they think that they're going to take over. In fact, I think quite the opposite is true. I think they bring a richness, a difference in perspective, and it actually informs the profession a lot more. It's important to improve the link between universities, professional bodies and governments. Remember this, that if governments lack faith in a profession to regulate itself, they will have to step in. And I think there have been examples of that in recent years across Australia. Industry itself, our industry is incredibly fragmented. We have eight different states and territories. We act as eight different countries in eight, and have eight different systems. And I often wonder if um, we shouldn't be, that building control itself should not be a federal function, take it away from the states altogether, which is a terrible thing to say, given that I'm talking to a Victorian government conference. But it, even the work that's being done by the Australian Building Codes Board over the years, they come up with fantastic opportunities. They put it out there for each state government to actually take up, and the state governments generally do. But if you go back and look at that work later on, three, four, five years down the track, each state has also already gone its own way. They tend to do that. It's inevitable. So I'm, just, I'm not necessarily arguing for it, but it just raises the question, should building control be a, a federal function? Another aspect which is really important to me, and I think it's important to our profession, is professionalism itself. Professional bodies need to take their role much more seriously than I think that they do across the board. Now, I'm not just talking about AIBS, I'm talking across the board. We hear a lot about codes of ethics and the issue of self-certification and conflict of interest. We're now hearing a lot about code of conduct, and I know there's a new one being written in Victoria. But the way I, I talk about the code of conduct is really how we meet our ethical obligations. And sometimes I think we, we focus so much on the code of conduct, we for, forget the ethical situation we should really be looking at. The other aspect about professionalism is that we should never be afraid to actually take disciplinary action against people, members of our profession who do not behave appropriately or carry out their jobs as they should. There seems to be a fear, and there has been a fear for many, many years to intervene. I think our professional bodies tend to want to step back and wait for the courts to do their job, or the state governments to do their job, or even individuals to take these people to court. Then they intervene and say, deregister or kick somebody out. I, my, I've been uh, lucky over the years to have been a member of seven different professional bodies, four in Australia and three overseas. Let me tell you, 
I think we can learn a lot from professional bodies outside our, our very strict profession. They go, they are very proactive. They keep a measure uh, of what's going on. They look over the profession very, very carefully. They have specialist committees that do that. And if something goes wrong or there's a, a problem, they actually they act very quickly. They investigate and then they will take action. It's important for professional bodies to improve their relationship with both universities and government. And they need to be taken seriously in order to be relevant. It's not unusual, you know, if, if, if the government doesn't believe you're doing the job that you should be doing, they ignore you. It's also important to improve program accreditation. By program, I mean the actual degree itself, how it's accredited. Now, it's accredited obviously by the university, but it also must be accredited and recognised by the industry. It's very important that the state government recognises that, the government recognises that. But if the profession itself by its professional body doesn't recognise that, then it's a real problem. It's also important to introduce and improve individual accreditation. That is, the way that we register individuals to actually practice. Um, and that my have always believed that that should be done by the professional body itself. I know state governments are involved across the board. But what should be happening is they should be working hand in glove to make sure this, it's a unitary system. Another aspect that's very important to me is that professional bodies really need to talk to one another. They need to improve their relationships. And I'll give you one example of that. I think that's broken down of, of late in Australia. Many years ago, I was part of a group that put together a joint approach to accreditation across Australia for the AIB, the AIQS and the AIBS. The rationale was that those three professional bodies looked at degrees that generally housed all three of those professions within one degree with different pathways. So to expect a university to host three different groups at three different times to pay for accommodation, to pay for airfares, to pay for wining and dining, and to go at different times, and also to expect the university to prepare very extensive accreditation documents was just unfair. So the idea was, why don't we do it jointly? We can reduce the number of people going, Many of us, like myself, were credit, uh, recognised across the board, so we could wear two or three hats. And it worked very, very well for some time, until in recent years, it's fallen apart. I speak to one professional body, they blame the other two. And it doesn't matter who I speak to, they always blame the other two. To me, that's, that's a cop-out. I think there is a problem there, and we should be working together. The other aspect that concerns me greatly is we gender equity. In building surveying, um, well, generally 51% of our population is female in this country. And in building surveying, I'm aware that there's only one female who is listed as a fellow. There's no life fellows at all. And very few females in our, in our profession, in building surveying, are actually in senior management roles within organisations. That also concerns me. Now, I'm really heartened by the Victorian government's push to actually increase the number of females in the profession. The other aspect that everybody keeps getting away from is this enforcement disciplining. You should not be afraid to carry out enforcement. Now, that is not just to actually get problems fixed up on site, but also to discipline the individuals who are not performing. I think of late, we, we've come to be aware of that, but often we've acted after the horse has bolted. That can be by government authorities, by professional bodies and by the court system. We should never be afraid to actually take that on because to be a true profession, we must be able to do that. So it's been a very, very quick presentation. My idea was to actually stoke some, some discussion. But my conclusion is this, that I believe in a system which clearly articulated, with clearly articulated roles for all the players in our industry, each of whom is accountable to the community interest. Professional bodies and universities must be proactive and lead this debate. Otherwise, governments will not take the profession seriously, will act to correct anomalies. This has been happening for a long time now in our country and especially in our profession. If we do nothing or continue the way that we have, the government, the insurance industry and the courts will do the job for us and we will have lost control of our profession. I actually believe that's what's been happening for some time now. I give the question for you is, is this what we want? Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carly Avery. I work with the VBA. Uh, 
There is the Q&A function if you do have an answer to that question or want to ask George any other questions, please use it. George, we have got one question come through, so I will uh, read it out now. It's um, it's it's a little bit long, so bear with me. How can CPC 60115, the Advanced Diploma of Building Surveying Students, be work ready when the government has instructed education institutions to deliver the whole course in less than nine months this year because it's been superseded? Some of the subjects are over 300 hours combined and will be del delivered over 27 hours in a three week block. So does the government expect the private sector to train these students? Most teachers have never worked in the building surveying industry and don't have a local qualification. What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting question. It's, it's a complex one. I'm not familiar with, with uh, that, the CPC itself. Um, what I would say is education generally ha has to be taken slowly and has to be taken care carefully. It doesn't mean that if you do things in intensive mode that they don't necessarily work, but there has to be cooperation between industry and, and the university or the, the TAFE college, whoever, the education institution. So if, if the government or somebody is insisting that, that things be delivered quickly, there must be some link up with industry, I think, and this is where uh, building surveying professionals or building surveying companies need to work with these education providers to ensure that there's a level of experience that they can achieve during the actual process of study. I don't think that's too hard to do if you're prepared to work together. The issue is that people just don't talk. My experience as I, uh, the many years at UniSA when I was there was that we had a great relationship with industry and every one of our students got a job during the course of their study. If it happens with us in Adelaide, I'm sure it can happen in wherever this CPC is actually happening at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I've got one, another one just come through. Hi, George. Do you think there is a role for micro credentials on building surveying to other professions like architects and engineers, as well as upskilling surveyors? Uh, yes, I, I think there is. I think the issue there is upskilling. Um, I, I, part of my presentation, I talked about trying to give, bring people in from outside, from different professions, to actually enrich the, the what we do. But I think it's also equally important to have our own people learn other skills. So that can be done by micro credentialing you know, compacted um, programs that actually teach new skills. I have no issue with that at all. I think there is a place for that, but it shouldn't stand uh, apart. It's all, almost like uh, training the existing staff to learn new things. And yes, I, I think that's a great thing to do. Thanks again. Okay, I've got another one. Having heard yesterday from Dame Judith Hackett, am I correct that you subscribe more to what she has put forward in raising the bar, in which industry through the entire chain have a duty to each other and the end user, and that we need to lift our competencies and the best way for industry to actually navel gaze a little, like the fire safety engineers have done through the Warren Centre? Sorry if I've got the intonation on that incorrect. I hope it makes sense. Well, I think the short answer to that is most definitely, I think we need to raise the bar across the board, but raising the bar across the board doesn't mean we keep all people out. I think that when I, we, we start to talk about university education versus say TAFE level education, uh, some people think, oh, we're trying to keep TAFE out. I'm not saying that at all. Um, and I don't think, uh, I didn't hear Dame Judith Blackett's uh, presentation today because the computer wasn't working at the time. Uh, but if she's talking about raising the bar, if people can come from any area at all and provide the pathways there for them to do it. And the issue with education is that in many situations, the pathways do not exist for people from all areas to come through. Provided they're capable of doing the work, then I would welcome everybody and anybody. And yes, I do think we need to lift the, raise the bar across the board. I, I think performance in itself is one of those ways. And I'm really heartened to see that the ABCB is doing a lot of work in that area at the moment. Um, what they'll find, it would be interesting once they reveal it. But that's the sort of stuff that for years we had, say, performance, but no one quite knew what to do with it. Uh, and there were lots of people in our industry who, who gave advice that, in my view, was not correct. Uh, and I think you need to start looking at how that actually has happened and go back and see how we actually train people to be able to do those jobs properly. So if that means raising the bar, and I'm not picking up those consultants at, on those consultants at all. I think that applies across the board. 
Great, thank you. And if anyone who has asked questions would like to ask a, a follow-up um, to George's comments, please feel free to shoot them through again. Uh, in the meantime, please, George, can you please talk about the challenge of empowering building surveyors to safely say no to builders and owners when protecting the integrity of the performance-based code? Well, I can go say that from my own experience, so not as a building surveyor per se, but as an architect, a very young architect. I went to a building site and I was absolutely flabbergasted. I, I was very raw, I didn't know much about it, but I, I measured a footing. And the footing was supposed to be 300 wide by 600 deep. Uh, I was very young and it was 299 wide by five, you know, what a 598 deep. And so I wanted to stop the pour. And luckily I had a, a wise old soul on the side who happened to be the engineer who designed that said, well, George, you know what happens when the concrete goes in? No it actually spreads the board. So you get more than 300. So what, what I'm trying to say to you is that we can learn from other people involved with that. Um, and it, it's not an issue per se, if we actually listen to people who've done the work before and we learn from them. Thank you. When, when you're sure of your um, decision though, or, or if you found that it, it wasn't accurate or, um, you know, as per your expectations, how do you handle those conversations when you're talking to other professionals in a, in a safe way? I think you, you, you need to be honest. And if, you, if you're sure, and then you'll have a statutory comeback to that, you, whether it be the building code or whether it be the state legislation, um, that, that's fine. Uh, the issue comes when you're not certain or when there are people there who know more about it than you do. In that situation, you, you, if you are definitely certain that, um, that the situation you're talking about is spot on. You have to learn how to communicate with people in a way that actually brings them around. You have to talk about the community interest as to why we're doing this. If, if I mean, I, once again, I stopped the poor many years ago that engineers had actually been and approved and I stopped it because they'd left out all the top reinforcement. But had that slab been poured, it would have collapsed. Um, now I was so definite about that and I stopped it. And you know what happened after that? I rang the engineer. And I thought that I would get a bollocking. In actual fact, he thanked me because had that actually happened, he would have been the one who copped it and somebody may well have been dead. So I think it's just trying to take a team approach and realising that we, we're in an industry where we all have a role and we can't all be uh, right 100% of the time. But if we rely on each other, that is treat the team, the, the construction engineer, the building engineer, the, the building surveyors, the planners, the architects, treat them as part of the team, you generally get a pretty good result. Great, thank you. Um, I've got another one. Is it possible and how to have a national building regulatory framework and national accreditation system? That is building surveyors recognised on a national level and not restricted to solely working in one state? My view is yes, it is possible. You just need the state governments to accept that that is no longer part of their function uh, or to at least give it to the, to the feds. So it's at that level. It's a little bit like state, uh, what is the state's role and what is the, the federal role? I think planning from what it's worth, uh, and I'm a planner as well, should be at the state level because there are different conditions, but, uh, and I know there are different climatic conditions for building, but in actual fact, the laws in terms of building are the same throughout the country. And yet we have the systems that actually support those laws are actually quite different. So the answer is yes, I think it can happen. There needs to be goodwill and you need to convince all the state governments that perhaps in the interest of a better building across the, the country and enabling all professions to work equally across the, the country as a whole, it's the way it should go. Having said that, um, I know it's going to be a very, very difficult task because it's a loss of state power and most state governments won't want to give it up. No problem. Well, that was the end of our question. So that would be good timing to thank you, George, um, for your presentation and for your responses. And thank you to everyone uh, on the session. There's more than 160 people. So thank you for the questions that have come through. Thank you.